HOD, uh, Mr. Schroeder, and uh, welcome. Um, before we get going, um, I think uh, I should just uh, include the rules of engagement for our virtual meetings for the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. Um, all members uh, have been muted at the beginning of the meeting, so we avoid uh, any background noises. Um, members should please flag any points of order using the chat function on Microsoft Teams. Uh, it should be used for points of order only. All video and audio should please be switched off um, so that we can improve the quality of the connection. However, the person presenting or speaking um, are welcome to, to use the video function and of course the mic. And once they have finished uh, presenting, if they would unshare and turn off the, um, the camera. So with that, um, as a first note, um, today we have the Western Cape uh, Education Department uh, presenting to the Ad Hoc Committee on COVID-19. Um, and, um, you know, before I hand over to the Minister, um, I just, you know, would like to acknowledge that the Department of Education uh, is on a very tricky tightrope to balance the need to protect our children now, to protect their well-being, and to protect their futures by ensuring that they can receive education. This is no small task and the burden is heavy. So we welcome here the department and the minister today to learn how you are managing in this difficult task. Uh, minister Schaefer, welcome. Um, would you like to make some introductory remarks and introduce your team, please? Minister Schaefer, are you on the line? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, let's start again. Uh, we certainly are feeling very keenly the weight that you refer to on our shoulders. Um, it's an extremely difficult space to be in. It's very easy to close schools. It's not so easy to reopen them again. And there are a lot of factors that have to be considered and a lot of measures that have to be taken. Um, so we find ourselves in a very uncertain space right now. Uh, with timelines that are changing all the time and it's extremely difficult to try and plan for that when we really aren't entirely sure what exactly, you know, the date is going to finally be after the uh, Command Council has made its decision. Um, I did, my team is, uh, is my HOD, Brian Schroeder, um, Peter Beertz is our Head um, of Curriculum and Teacher Development. I don't even know who else is on here because I can't see on the list. So I'm going to ask them when they, if they have to speak, if they can introduce themselves at the time that they speak. But as our senior management uh, executive um, and various other people from the department, um, I do think that we have done remarkably well during this lockdown period. It was done at short notice. It's something we could never have anticipated at the beginning of the year. Anything in education takes a very long time to land because it is a huge system. It needs a lot of planning. It needs procurement. Um, and now we're sitting having to procure a whole lot more equipment and masks and, and PPE and so on, uh, extra sanitizer and so on. So um, our people have all been really working on that. Um, but I particularly want to congratulate, other than my HOD, who has literally been working day and night, um, Ms. Dr. Peter Beards and his uh, curriculum team as well as our e-learning team, Clinton Walker and his, uh, his, his team, on putting together some incredible materials uh, online on our e-portal for learners at home, for parents to use and teachers to use. And also to all our teachers who really have been trying, very, a lot of them have been trying so hard from home to try and connect with their children and uh, make sure they do whatever they can to, to assist them. But it is complex, it's extremely difficult. Um, it is a huge worry, the amount of time we've actually um, lost from teaching. And when you look at the impact that has um, also on the economy, obviously lives are more important than money, but it's got a huge impact on the economy as well because it affects earning capacity later in life. And people sometimes have this um, idea, well, we don't care, we'll just let our children stay back. But if everyone does that, um, we're going to have an entire new grade next year coming in as well. So it isn't that simple. But um, I'm going to ask that my HOD, uh, we have prepared a presentation as to what we have done and are doing. And if I can just hand over to him now to present that, please. Thank good you. Morning. Please proceed. Uh, good morning, Chair, um, Minister and colleagues. Good morning. 
Just to say that the people that are online is uh, Dr. Peter Beards, uh, DDG Curriculum and Assessment, uh, Mr. Saleh Abrams, DDG Education Planning, um, Mr. Leon Eli, uh, DDG Corporate Services and CFO, uh, DDG Archie Lewis, Institutional Development and Coordination, responsible for schools, also uh, Wanda Conrad, uh, Director Business Strategy and Stakeholder Management, and uh, Ms. Brona Hammond, our Director Communications. I also see that Mr. Ian De Vega, our uh, Chief Director of uh, Business Intelligence Management is on. That's the team in the background. Not all of them will speak, but um, uh, they they have a, a key input into this space. Um, Chair, um, I am just going to call up a presentation and share a presentation with you. I know that you have copies of it, um, but uh, I would wish to speak to the presentation. Um, just allow me to close quickly. If you'll just chair, indicate to me whether you do in fact have it on your screen. We can see it, yes. Great, thank, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. So, so uh, Chair, there are a number of things that you asked of uh, Minister Schaefer um, in the briefing. The first thing that there were a number of questions that you asked about uh, in general. Uh, firstly, uh, issue about the lockdown and how does it impact on learners in the academic year? Um, uh, in many ways, devastating, but we will uh, recover and survive. Then you asked about the plan or the strategy to deal with learners that uh, will return after the lockdown, and there are uncertainties, which I'm sure Minister will elaborate on going forward. Uh, in the light of the um, outbreak, how will the schooling system continue from now on? I've, I've got lots I can keep you uh, covered on that. Also with international um, engagement that I'm busy with, uh, I will say to you that education across the world will not be the same. And education in this country must change. And there are a number of positives that I believe that come out of this if there is intelligent observation of the issues in education leadership across the country. And I say that because um, whilst we've been working excessively over time, to limit the inequalities that exist, and with some success in the Western Cape. We've not managed to eradicate that. And one of the things that we've been working on for a long time had been the e-learning strategy, which many people think is a technology strategy, but it isn't. It's a pro-poor strategy intended to bridge the inequality gap. It's one of our dual systems. And if nothing else happens across the world, technology enhancement will um, accelerate um, for learning. Um, and uh, in the Western Cape, we have the advantage of having spent some years with a degree of foresight uh, in preparing for it, but there's still a long, long way to go. And there's certainly no way to turn around if COVID-19 has taught the world in, of education. One thing, it is that uh, technology for a blended learning approach is required. I'm sure you'll ask me many questions as we get to this point. The point I want to make is technology can't replace face-to-face uh, -face education, not for many years, but moving to a blended education system is undoubtedly key. And the inhibitors have been more teachers to some degree than learners because learners have an innate affinity to technology. Uh, you can just look around wherever you see kids. But the teachers in the Western Cape have really rallied for the last three years and therefore are far better placed across the nation than in many other provinces. Um, and this will accelerate that process. You then also ask that we speak about the, the nature of the school buildings and what we've done in that space, particularly no doubt because of the media coverage around uh, devastation, uh, vandalism uh, across the world. The second aspect you asked us to speak on is the whole issue of distance learning, home learning, and issues related to that. You've asked about special learning needs um, or special needs learning and, and what we've done in that regard. And then the issue of school feeding, which, which uh, I will speak to also at length and which I'm quite passionate about uh, going forward. So Chair, with, with that in mind, I'm going to start off with a bit of detail. Firstly, the academic year, um, as um, all of you would know, certainly the Education Standing Committee would know, Four terms uh, broken up into between 10 and 11 weeks a term. On the left-hand side, you see the dates that had been scheduled for the term and the number of days, uh, including the public holidays, 
that uh, are in each of those terms. Approximately 202 days for teachers, the number in brackets are the days that teachers normally attend, 198 the days that learners are supposed to attend. COVID-19 has caused, first of all, the closure of schools on the 18th March, slightly premature by a few days. Um, and the envisaged date had been the 1st of June. Now, I say had been because there are many aspects that are quite unsure about that space. If the entire system went back on the 4th of June, 42 days would have been lost. 42 actual school days would have been lost. Um, and as you know, that some of the pattern that had originally been shared with the public had been a spacing of grade returns, which would have, with the 1st of June return, meant somewhere in uh, around about the uh, 15th of July, the last grouping coming in. Um, that is all unclear now. So that's that's the academic year and how it's been affected, and it and the rest of it is still not clear to to us or to anyone else. Um, there are a number of aspects related to our strategy to support learners during lockdown. There's one thing which the WCED had stood for for a long time, and that's um, based on its vision. And the vision is quality education for every child in every classroom in every school in the province. That is a is a vision that has been established because of the recognition that not every child is getting quality and it's often poor kids that don't. And so we're rallying the entire education system and fraternity to try to assist uh, in getting those inequalities um, um, uh, minimized, if not uh, totally um, annihilated. Unfortunately, things such as COVID-19 will in all probability uh, exacerbate um, the inequalities. It certainly highlighted the inequalities which exist. So uh, the whole aspect has been to try to continue teaching and learning in every subject in every grade during the lockdown as much as possible. And whilst that teaching has happened in many schools and really many, many teachers, which I need to salute, has worked tirelessly in this time uh, to make distance learning available, to prepare lessons, to prepare videos, et cetera. And even learners in poor communities, they've used WhatsApp under certain circumstances to reach kids and paper-based um, notes. Uh, and I'll speak a bit more about that as we go along. So the whole intent had been to try to keep learning going after the initial holiday period, because kids need a holiday when they get a holiday. Uh, we've also started to adapt the curriculum, focus on core concepts and competencies. And I say that because the curriculum needs to be trimmed with days lost. The actual model for the curriculum trimming across the nation, and remember curriculum is a national competence, it's a core competence, there is a national core curriculum, um, and therefore it needs to be adapted nationally. We're trying to feed into that space, and we're trying to also continue with the wisdom that the Western Cape um, officials and teachers have to make the most sensible adjustments um, due to COVID-19. Support teachers and parents in providing home and teaching and learning or providing at home teaching and learning. And we've done that in a number of ways that I'll speak to in a minute. And lastly, uh, we used modes that will uh, ensure improved access to learning uh, material and support and there's a variety in, in that regard. So the, um, the issue of back to school, and we've started to prepare uh, some time ago, the reality of going back to school and the issues that are required and needed in this regard. And um, um, the intent of Minister Mocheka's announcement had been that all uh, school management teams and non-teaching and cleaning staff return this coming Monday the 11th. Initially, it was suggested the 4th and the 5th of May last week, um, this past week. In the announcement, then the minister said that the education sector must get back into action this last week. In other words, officials have slowly started to be identified to go back to work, uh, both in head office and in district offices. And that's happened uh, cautiously uh, and with the key identifiers first. Coming Monday would be the SMTs and non-teaching and cleaning staff. And a week later, all teachers are to return, according to the minister's um, directive. And then there's a two-week break before grades 12 and 7 are set to return. Um, but the minister has also indicated that that return depends on the National uh, COVID Command Council and cabinet approval 
if they are satisfied, if DBE is able to satisfy those two bodies of the fact that the system is ready uh, to receive learners back. And therefore, it remains an uncertainty uh, in the system and in the public domain. So the DB has proposed a phasing in. And, um, and I, I want to just say that um, uh, adjusted curriculum, um, if I may just go back quickly to that grade, and, that grade 12 and grade 7 suggestion. There's one gap in there which the Western Cape has fairly relentlessly advised DBE on because we believe it's important, but it's not found up to this point um, fertile uh, thinking. And that is that we are concerned about foundation phase learners that at the moment will have the longest break by whatever phased in mode that there might be. That clearly implies that the foundation phase learners, if they go back July or August, then it means that they've got the most days broken and yet they are the learners that are in the foundation phase years um, needed to establish reading for learning, to establish counting and thinking patterns and skills. And that lapse, um, we would have to think very carefully about that is addressed, how that is addressed. Otherwise, it could be disadvantage, which is carried along for the rest of learners' uh, careers. We suggested, therefore, that those learners come back earlier, particularly because the youngest learners are least vulnerable by all indications across the world. Um, but the thinking about 12 and 7 had been because it's the seniors in a school 12 is the senior in high school, 7 is the senior in primary school, and therefore they could give leadership to younger kids as they return, and so there's a degree of, of understanding in that space as well. So for that phasing in, there's an understanding from DBE that there must be an adjusted curriculum um, that is then based on a guideline of change curriculum would be finalized by the 15th of May. Um, for the entire curriculum, but it's of course particularly uh, important for the first grades that go back. Um, these things may change as the pandemic affects the country or certain provinces or municipalities. Uh, we also need to be flexible because we understand that it's quite possible that not all schools across the entire country go back at the same time or remain open in the event of hotspot areas that might be raised back or declared uh, lockdown level five again, in which case schools will close in those areas, but not across the entire curriculum. Besides that, individual schools might need to be closed as we go forward. It needs careful management and careful decision making in the event of incidences that might happen at particular schools or groups of schools. Um, the, um, so what I'm saying is that there's a requirement for very hands-on and careful at the provincial level, understanding, management, and decision making. Current position is that the grade 12 curriculum re will require no adaptation. It's getting tight because the ability to catch up the grade 12 curriculum for the NEC exams, even if the NEC exams gets delayed by a few weeks or a month, um, there's still quite a bit that needs to be done there. Again, the Western Cape's opinion is slightly different. We believe that there could still be certain um, minor trimming of that curriculum and the adjustment of exams, even if it is in the actual exam, um, uh, if the papers have already been set. But we believe that adjustments are still uh, possible to be made. Nonetheless, the current thinking is that the grade 12 curriculum will remain. And there's a consensus across the nation that uh, the grade 12s must, we must do everything in our power to conclude their education this year simply because you need to have progression through the system because the grade one age group next year must, they must be placed in the system to receive them. And so uh, there is that consensus across the entire system. It's agreed that there won't be any June exams for all grades um, and that there'll be adjustments to the assessments going forward but that for the grade 12s, there will be a, a trial examination, September, maybe a bit later, but uh, in the middle of the remaining year. And um, that there are amendments to the school-based assessments, which form part of the grade 12s, and also the practical um, uh, components um, of subjects, uh, the practical assessment tasks, PATs, PATs. Um, there could be adjustments for the different components that make up that in the end for the evaluation. So there's a lot of thinking and work that is necessary. 
Now, when Linus returned, the Western Cape has decided on a number of things. First of all, that if grade 7 and grade 12 returns, um, it's important that we adhere to the COVID requirements, the guidelines for safety for learners and teachers, um, and that uh, there are new um, teaching um, and assessment uh, um, policy or protocols in place, um, guidelines, and the timetabling guidelines are required so that we try to, in the initial stages of schooling, retain social distancing, which when the entire system is back is not possible. Neither is it possible in learner transport schemes once two or three grades are back. And the reality therefore is that either social distancing has to be resolved, in other words, we need to move past the peak of the infections, um, or we can't have the entire system back. A second aspect that we need to consider is uh, the whole aspect of teacher support, not only teacher well-being and mental support, but also the support in uh, a number of things. And we have developed WCD lessons uh, for teaching at home. Uh, we've also supported teachers through the use of ICT and other methods of support, remote uh, teaching in, uh, and including the Cape Teaching and Leadership Institute offerings, which is, as you know, the Western Cape Education Department Institute, the Cape Teaching and Leadership Institute. It's an in-service training institute for our teachers and psychosocial support. The third one is the issue of continuing core lessons uh, with core competencies and skills, not the entire content knowledge that has to be absorbed uh, for a, a trimmed year. Dedicated teaching plan for grade 12s must be in place so that we can uh, recover everything that we can, continue lessons for all the other grades, um, and uh, the adapted curriculum, in my view, must give teachers a fair degree of flexibility to be able to adapt according to the needs, the individual needs in individual schools. And then fourth, resources, uh, quality online resources on our ePOL. Um, in this short space, uh, Minister um, uh, Schaefer has made reference to the curriculum team under Dr. Beards that has made enormous strides um, from, a, from already a sound platform in this regard, including WhatsApp posters. Uh, just this day, Minister, Minister might not know it yet, uh, we've introduced the first foundation phase interactive posters. It's a poster that uh, has uh, can be put up and there's an, there's a, if you interact on the poster on a device, electronic poster, then there are little videos that come up um, for the foundation phase. And then uh, the adapted curriculum for other grades uh, are also essential. Then the question of uh, preparation for back to school and what happens when kids are back to school. First of all, we have ordered sanitation and hygiene packs for schools. Uh, key elements of that are hand sanitizers, liquid soap, uh, face masks for all teachers and all learners. And in the Western Cape, we've ordered masks for all teachers and all learners in all schools, not just quintile one, two, and three. Um, and we have uh, also ordered um, digital thermometers that are non-contact thermometers for screening purposes um, and uh, cleaning material, including uh, bleach, etc., disinfectant material. Um, now, these, in procuring and ordering them, these aspects is a challenge. You don't get it. It's not a one-stop procurement. We've got 1,500 schools. It's a huge undertaking. The masks alone, we need 2.4 million masks for all teachers and learners. Uh, a slightly over 2.4 million. I mean, that's costing uh, 50 odd million rand, Leon Eli will tell you, just for the masks. Um, it's a huge additional expense, but it's an important expense uh, for safety of learners and teachers going forward. We all know that masks don't protect the wearer, mask protects the people around them. Um, and you will have had that from health, I'm sure. Then the aspect of schooling now and going forward. Um, we will at all times adhere to the COVID-19 safety requirements. And I think a lot of the school day will, when learners are back, be taken up with this. It'll definitely take away teaching time. But it's essential that, first of all, we keep this our plants safe, our schools safe. In other words, the screening requirement on a daily basis for everyone that steps over, uh, as it were, the, the gate or in, in the gate, must be there because it's the best way that we can do everything in our power to keep um, the vicinity inside a school safe. We are very aware of the reality of, of this virus and the 
health department tells us it's most unlikely that kids will spread this virus. It's far more likely that teachers will, will spread the virus because teachers go to shops and to petrol stations and to all kinds of other things uh, and are consequently more, um, more, more prone to, uh, to be exposed to the virus. Uh, find appropriate ways to sustain quality teaching for every learner. And I want to make the point here, Chair, that whilst we say this, why it is absolutely critical that we don't overburden our children or our teachers due to a global pandemic that is no one's fault. And consequently, we can't demand, and I've asked my curriculum people to stop talking about catch-up, because catch-up means you try to do everything that you missed, and it's not possible. So we're saying we want to adapt so that we don't kill our people with excessive hours or excessive times or excessive pressure. We will extract the key curriculum aspects and we'll explain to teacher that flexibility so that we find appropriate ways to sustain quality teaching for every learner. That doesn't mean total content. Focus on core subject contents and competencies uh, as a key aspect. Now, initially, when there was not a clear understanding of how long schooling would uh, be um, be um, disrupted. They was thinking that you could still just decide what content you must you must trim from the curriculum. But the longer the break in schooling, the more the critical aspects that I've asked our curriculum people to carry into the national discourse is not content, but what are the key competencies and skills that are necessary in every grade to scaffold learning for the next grade as opposed to the content of that grade. And uh, in the Western Cape, we understand that concept uh, very clearly and very well. And um, we're hoping to influence um, the national process. Um, and we will also have a degree of flexibility for our teachers um, if, if we're not fully heard. But I think uh, we certainly are in many ways heard, particularly on the curriculum field. Um, then we must support teachers uh, also in the remote teaching because inevitably, even if schools come back, we believe that there will be some disruption going forward, some learning disruption, and therefore our teachers have to be ready with the possibility of being able to uh, send work that has been prepared for weeks ahead home with learners and to be able to engage with learners in various ways from time to time. Uh, increased parental support uh, to learners at home or to learning at home without expecting the parents to think that they have to be teachers and putting that burden on parents, which isn't possible. But there is a lot that parents as the primary caregivers can do in supporting the development and the learning of their children without thinking that they have to be the experts or teachers. Uh, and then agitate for improved access to ICT as we go along, particularly for poor learners in a variety of ways. That includes um, the, the issue about zero rating our portals and, and access to learners. It includes an ongoing conversation around expanding free Wi-Fi hotspots in the province that exist. Um, and uh, that conversation is happening also in PTM and other places. Improved instructional lead leadership for new teaching realities because there will be new teaching realities and therefore the adaptation of teachers are important. Um, I come now to psychosocial support and then special, special education needs. Um, this is an aspect which you didn't specifically um, ask for, if I remember correctly, Chair, but it is one that is in significant discourse nationally and overseas at the moment. Um, and a part of this is ensuring that uh, all our teachers and all our support staff in districts um, have an understanding about who all can play a role and how important it is that the psychosocial support to learners are available and in place. Um, and this is a flow chart diagram. Uh, it, a lot hinges around the school-based uh, support teams, which exist in every school as it is. Every school has a school-based support team for learner support. Um, and you will see there are a number of issues there. It impacts on additional class teacher intervention or support, uh, learner support, um, and, and other school uh, nurse care and, and other um, health support or social support. Um, and then there are also um, circuit or cluster-based support teams, which is the next layer or level. And there's a different impact to the low level support required or the moderate level support or the high level support that's required in special schools and so forth. Um, 
a few of these slides, Chair, are quite uh, rich and, and I invite you to study them and, and you're welcome even after this engagement. Uh, if we don't get to all the, the questions and the unpacking of it, you're welcome to contact me and, and I'll put you in contact with whoever can support. Most importantly also is the employee health and wellness. We've done a lot in this regard, both in the province. Uh, we have, in fact, just before COVID-19 came about, we had um, reaffirmed uh, a contract for employee health, uh, uh, health and wellness programs. And you can see um, that there are a number of issues. There are 24 seven um, confidential and professional support to uh, our teachers and officials um, and the immediate family members of our employees. Um, and and it, it, it uh, uh, addresses a range of, of subjects. If I can just enlarge it for you quickly family challenges, financial advice, even health and wellness, HIV AIDS, work life support, personal budgeting, relationships, stress management, substance abuse, trauma, legal advice, medical advice, work related challenges. Uh, uh, Chair, these are issues that are real in the lives of our employees, whether teachers or whether uh, officials. Um, good, then uh, you asked about the safety. Now, as of the 4th of May, there have been 82 reported cases of burglary and vandalism. Initially, you can understand that it was not necessarily known from the school. It came from communities because the schools were in lockdown. It came from uh, SAPs, Visible Policing and Metro Police that would identify issues. Uh, by far, the majority of the cases were minor vandalism. Um, and I almost, I don't want to say superficial because we're not 100% um, uh, clear of all the potential damage because we've not been in schools uh, during the lockdown and we've not had principals uh, go to check the degree of the vandalism, but we're aware of 82 reported cases uh, since the uh, 4th of May. Um, we have added additional day security and we've doubled night security in schools during the lockdown uh, in high risk areas. We've also had canines, and when I spoke to Minister Schaefer about this, I said, you'll enjoy this. Clearly, those of us that are preparing these slides are watching too many uh, uh, DSTV programs now because we're at home. And so we get into canines. Minister then said, I should make it a K with a nine because that uh, the committee will understand. It just means that there are also dogs that were employed uh, in some schools to deter people from entering the premises. Uh, the additional security that we added in this lockdown is 6.1 million's worth for 470 schools uh, up until the 11th of May. Uh, and we continue to engage with SAPS and community policing. When the SMTs return to school, one of the things that they have to do is to just double check um, on, on um, safety and burglaries. We will have teams with DTPW in place to address the most urgent of those um, as the need arises. So I just want to speak a little bit about the, the distance learning and the e-learning platforms that are in many ways quite substantial in, in the Western Cape. Um, and we've coined it uh, amongst others during lockdown quality learning at home. Um, and we've encouraged people to access as much as they can uh, from a variety of sources. Um, there are indications in this slide of what was in place pre-lockdown in the general education and training band, which is grade R to grade nine on the left, and the FET band or further education and training band, grades 10 to 12 on the right. So you see that there's stuff in pre-lockdown um, for those uh, subject guidelines and quality reading indicators. And for the senior learners, there was a, a one, term one revision program and tutoring uh, in designated subjects were in place. During the lockdown, the support, the support strategy included for the um, grades below grade nine, weekly core lessons for grade R to grade nine, which were available. And also RSG Radio 2000 uh, in conjunction with uh, Gauteng Department of Education and a variety of TV programs, uh, issues that were in place. These are the ones that we um, directed, but there were many also DBE and other programs that were available. Uh, and for the seniors, uh, the weekly core lessons for grade 10 to 12 were um, made available, uh, developed and made available, and also 
our telematics broadcasts happened for grades 10 to 12. You are aware that we telecast lessons uh, using satellite technology uh, in partnership with the University of Stellenbosch. We've done this now for more than 10 years. It's now, I think, the 11th or the 12th year um, to schools. Um, and that telematics program, um, incidentally, also has the lessons that we telecast um, we have broken down into uh, bite-sized video clips, which are also available, um, nicely categorized uh, in our e-portal, on our e-portal. And then um, going forward, uh, uh, that is teacher professional development at the CTLI, um, how to teach online, and uh, also edulous <coughs> excuse me, e-books and e-journals. And um, you will, that program, how to teach online, we initially thought there would be one group of teachers, and I'm under correction, but I think there were 1,800 that enrolled for it. We had to have subsequent programs, uh, and we have, uh, we've now run a host of programs uh, in that. Again, it shows the thirst of our teachers, their readiness for it, their understanding of the realities of what, um, of what this is bringing and, and their new reality going forward. And uh, for senior learners, um, optimizing the WCDE portal and, and other support uh, for parental support was also made available. Um, the online learning um, made uh, quality digital resources available. And there were resources in four categories, if you like. There was a school's closure pack. Uh, we also coined the phrase, school is closed, but learning is open. A great catchphrase that uh, was well received. Um, and uh, we have learner dashboard um, on a variety of issues, grade 10 to 12, they can register on, on this through our portal. Uh, the e-portal has got thousands of resources on it accessible for, for all subjects and grades. I'm not yet satisfied, Chair, that we have everything, because one of the things that I've instructed poor Peter Bits and his team to do is to ensure that in double quick time, we have for every subject, for every grade, every single day's lesson taped that can be accessed from one of our best teachers. That's a huge undertaking, and uh, I've given him a year to do it in, and, uh, and then we will have um, available everything online. And it doesn't matter if DB then changes the curriculum, because then we'll just do it again. It's an ongoing thing. It's not a one-off thing. Um, and then how to share e-resources -re -e is, a, is a fourth uh, section or category of that work. Um, just a few examples of the initiatives. Uh, on the left, you see there the weekly core lessons in every grade. Uh, you can take a look at the detail. Um, example for grade one, uh, the week of 20 to 24 April, it gives an indication. If I just enhance it a little bit for home language, for first additional, for mathematics, it tells you what are the things that are being done, and it tells you if you click here, you get resources. It's an interactive engagement. It takes you to resources, um, and you can get a lesson plan if you click there, etc. If you click on the teacher, it shows you videos, uh, video lessons that is available in that space. It's really a great resource, uh, or it's not only a resource, a great set of resources. Um, on the right, the reading exercises for parents and learners. Um, again, um, quality reading at home, it uh, tells parents uh, the role that they can play. It gives you tips for parents, Let's see if it's a bit more readable. Um, uh, daily reading exercises that they can use for, for different uh, grades and years, and how to measure your child's reading skills, and, and there are examples of, of what they can do uh, in that space. These are just uh, chair examples of, uh, of resources and initiatives that we've launched and accelerated in the lockdown period. Um, Chair, um, another example there, um, on the left you have metric resources, and on the right aspects related to teacher remote learning or remote training, how uh, aspects that teachers can utilize, how to get up, uh, set up Google Classrooms, how to use WhatsApp uh, in lessons, how to download videos from YouTube, um, some really great stuff, um, and it's it's hours and hours of uh, of valuable uh, engagement. On the left, the metric resources, um, quality learning, WCDE portal tells you what is on it, uh, etc. I'm not going to spend the detail. You're welcome to to not only look at it but also test it. 
for the record, the WCDE portal can be found and is accessible to anyone who has access. It's wcdeportal.co.za. WCDE portal, one word, .co.za. Um, but because we're very aware that not all our learners have digital access, although at least 60% of learners have access to cell phones, but it's the cost of data and connectivity. And even more of learners in poor communities have access to TVs. TVs are in, I don't want to say almost every shack because that's not true or not fair, but you do know what I mean, that there's a fair coverage uh, of TV. And so there are a number of broadcasts for learners that don't have digital access. Um, and the examples are uh, are on the left there. Um, Ereschia, Umshlombu, Mweni, uh, SABC, Radio 2000, uh, DSTV had dedicated channels, two dedicated channels um, for um, higher and uh, lower grades. Uh, also, workbooks and revision papers were available uh, in hard copy. And many schools, when learners came in for food, also handed them printed worksheets that they could take home and work on. So there was a real attempt at also um, the other part of learning that uh, tries to understand that not everyone has the access to digital learning. Chair, so you asked about special uh, special needs learning, and um, there are different categories of special needs learning. Uh, each of these have got a special attention to it. Um, and um, the initial thinking was that the first groupings of these schools that would go back would be aligned to the grade 12, seven idea might change if that changes in the DBE framework. Um, the timelines on the right, uh, I've taken out because we don't know what they are. If grade 12 and grade seven goes back um, on the 1st of June, then these equivalents will also go back. Um, those that are in grade seven and 12 for deaf and seven and 12 for blind, et cetera, will go back as well. Um, schools with cerebral palsy, uh, we, that's not a year group, and we'll see uh, those um, with adapted curricula can go back when it's safe. Um, and also the severe intellectual disability and the autism spectrum disorder group will phase in as uh, it becomes appropriate. And so the youth care centers are already operational, as you know, they're not managed by WCD. Uh, and hospital schools, learners are in hospital, there is support to them as uh, as things continue. Um, I also just want to say that um, on the right, you've got a whole host of resources that we have for uh, tips for parents, uh, COVID-19, autism, for example. There are a whole host of issues and tips that are available on our website and elsewhere. Um, and the schools are engaging with the SLES team for curriculum support. Um, they've been doing so in the lockdown. Various groups have created an at-home learning support group adapted to meet a variety of needs. Our special schools in the Western Cape are of the best in the world and certainly the teachers are dedicated and highly creative. Information and guidance for parents has also been distributed or have been distributed uh, focusing on activities for different disabilities. Um, and then learning materials, activities and resources, and also pre-lockdown worksheets had been created and were distributed. Um, <clears throat> additional support to various SLES categories, you can read there. Uh, learners with barriers to learning, what is available and has been done. Therapy components um, that are available, videos on practical activities for parents and learners that, uh, as some parents need specific guidance, for example. Learners who are in wheelchairs or have profound intellectual disabilities, many of these get managed uh, at a school, in a school environment on a daily basis and give parents a degree of, uh, or, a, or a time away, and in lockdown that doesn't happen. And so we've given uh, parents particular support in the autism spectrum disorder, information leaflets for parents, uh, were sent out to assist parents during lockdown and so forth. And all of these aspects uh, are there. Um, deaf learners who um, do not use sign language, but who, who do um, lip reading, for example, are quite challenged uh, with the masks. And there's been a call, for example, that we have see-through masks uh, or alternative options. Um, I have um, 
in one or two of my tweets made reference to some of the screen type um, protectors um, which would display a mouth or a lips and th those are the kinds of things that we we check out for learners with special needs and then chair nearly done um, support to learners with barriers to learning a little bit more um, in that space for you uh, assisting parents with developing home programs and so forth has been done so i come to the last category and that's school feeding during lockdown now you might be aware that uh, quite early on, we recognize the dire need of the, the kids. We, we normally feed about 480 odd thousand kids two meals a day. And, not, and those aren't all the kids that need it in this province. Now, the moment the schools are on lockdown or closed, we don't normally feed in a school holiday, even in the June or, de or December holiday. But when you have a national or a global pandemic, that break, in time is different because during june and december parents still get money or they can get a job or they can maybe do many of the poor kids uh, poor parents are those that have kind of day-to-day -day jobs or jobs that bring in some money in a lockdown that's gone and so the dire need for kids uh, particularly kids that are hungry uh, early on we said we we have to do something about it we got opposition uh, from variety of sources. We understand the opposition that we got as well. We spoke with all the different sectors and bodies, um, but we stuck with our determination to feed and we utilized uh, uh, the school feeding setup to feed kids where it was possible, recognizing that not all kids could get to their schools. For example, kids that go to school by bus can't get to their school. And so we also said that kids could go to their nearest school that feeds if they are on a school feeding scheme. Um, we made all the provision, even before people raised the concerns, to make sure that safety is in place. And, um, and in the month from the 8th to the 30th of April, we fed 912,988 learner meals just in that time. Now, it's about a quarter of all learners that normally get fed. Um, and uh, we really hope that that will up shortly. And the more we talk about schools going back and the more we understand and we uh, create an understanding, I mean, more and more pressure is coming on national and everyone else to feed the kids. And we opted not to feed food parcels because in the first place, food parcels are up to to 10 times more than the way we feed because we buy in bulk and we prepare in bulk and we dish out in containers. The moment you go to food parcels, there are two problems. First of all, it's 10 times more expensive, between four and 10 times. Secondly, food parcels have become a source of desire. They're easy for hungry people to try to steal. And you've seen trucks being hijacked for food parcels and being shared, et cetera. Again, we understand the social need of it, and therefore we also part of the conversation around the importance of, uh, of, of food parcels for hungry people. But we are able as education to make a, an impact for kids. And because we're able to feed them nourishing hot meals, um, and we've opted to do it twice a week with a meal that's big enough to be able to be uh, uh, two or three meals, and we've not let them sit down. We've had safety and all of that space in place. So um, we, we've opted for the for the school feeding during lockdown. And um, I mean, I was threatened with uh, with being charged. I was threatened with arrest um, because of it. Um, and I, I I struggle to understand the uh, the challenges that faced. We were within the regulations. We double checked the legal positioning on it. We do understand that the moment that you have people moving, there's potential higher risk than if people stay at home nicely and not move out of their homes. We understand that. But you've got to also weigh that up about the inability to feed 480,000 kids in different houses every day. Just, it just isn't possible. So just to say that the safety measures that we put in place, um, uh, we, we um, insist on social distancing, 
Um, learners in queues must be spaced 1.5 meters away. They don't sit down and eat at schools. There's uh, supervision. Um, we we uh, ensure that sanity is there. And many schools wash kids' hands or sanitize their hands before they eat. We've instructed that they must come to school, take their food, and go straight home. We've engaged with municipalities and, uh, and SAPs to assist wherever possible to avoid kids loitering and uh, elsewhere. We can't take responsibility for everything. We also said that parents must ensure that the kids go to school to get the meal and come back straight away. Um, and we've certainly done everything in our power, both in ensuring uh, hygiene safety in the COVID-19 context. Um, and also we've also, the first group that we ordered protective uh, materials for was for the feeding scheme groups and the schools that opted uh, to feed. Uh, we did that, that was the first order of protective material that we placed. Um, so there are stringent safety measures in place. Uh, we sent out an, uh, an operating um, um, a, uh, a feeding protocol to schools and we reiterated that on more than one occasion. Uh, these are examples, Chair, uh, in conclusion of learners lining up in orderly fashions in most instances. Uh, the, we spoke about food handler safety, um, social distancing, of kids sanitizing of hands, et cetera. Um, um, those are examples of what happens. And uh, and there has been some additional donations also for which we've been quite pleased, particularly those people that recognize the importance of the of the feeding at schools. Uh, Chair, I hope that I've more or less covered the areas that you had uh, had wanted us to give you input on. And, uh, and I say thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schroeder, for um, having prepared that presentation uh, and um, assisting us with information on those questions that the members of the committee uh, had uh, prior to this engagement. Um, we'll now move to a round of questions. Um, I will do a round of questions from all the members and then um, provide the department with an opportunity to respond. Um, given that we only have one department uh, before us today, I'm going to make the question time slightly longer to four minutes per member. Um, and then as usual, uh, we will start uh, with the DA. Does the DA have any questions for the education department? Thank you, Chairperson, yes. Um, thank I'm you for that. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the comprehensive presentation. Minister, um, with the rapid spread of the pandemic in our province, is it wise to have schools reopen from the 1st of June as per the national um, directive? Have you engaged with the national minister around this? Um, and is uh, WCED going to provide teachers, principals and cleaning staff with any special training on COVID-19 before um, our schools should open? Is there already an SOP in place? Um, many parents have lost income or the employment. Will the WCED reopen applications for fee exemptions? Also, if you could speak to, um, can schools apply to be a no fee school at this stage? And then with regards to the um, teachers that are 60 years and older, who are deemed high risk, for contracting COVID-19, whose grades are not yet returning to school come 1st of June, um, are they expected to return to school by then or by the 18th of May? Then when the, um, when a P, the PPE, um, uh, when will the PPP, PPE delivered to, to schools? When will that be? When can schools expect that? And then with regards to sanitization, will all uh, classrooms and schools be um, sanitized? And how exactly will this program work? And then with regards to SG um, school hostels, is this included in a sanitization program? And is WCED working according to the Department of Health's COVID-19 hotspot areas? Um, and then, SG, given the overcrowding in many of our schools, what is the plan in place for social distancing in our classrooms? 
Will WCED ensure that schools adhere to the COVID-19 safety regulations? How will you ensure that? And then um, again to the school hostels, will this automatically reopen when the schools open? Uh, SG, in terms of the isolation of learners who are hostel residents, say for instance, they are now learners that come from other um, areas or other provinces or neighboring countries, how would that work? What is the protocols for that? And then also speak to the protocols in place if there is a COVID-19 case at a school. Um, then Chair, um, how, how is our parents going to be taken on this journey, especially our poor parents in terms of quintiles one, two and three, and that is with regards to the um, social platform learning um, SG. And then has the um, department received any application from independent schools to um, reopen already? And then what, how would the um, COVID-19 um, um, disaster that we are in what is in the in timeline what is the setback for our infrastructure um, projects and then was um, WCED approach to avail school hostels or other infrastructure for isolation or quarantine facilities if so what are the views and options to assist the Western Cape government in this regard your time is expiring um, on the board, Thank you. I'm right on Thanks. time. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you were writing fast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I, I was going to say, Chair, if, um, if every member has got four minutes, uh, <laughs> we'll never get to answers to these questions. <laughs> sure. Um, so members have different formats for how they ask uh, questions. Some might make comments. Um, so I, I'm just going to take one or two more members. If the questions are uh, very lengthy, we'll pause, uh, allow you an opportunity to respond, and we'll, then we'll continue. Um, okay. On that note, then I recognise the ANC. Thank you, Chair. Um, that on the side. Yeah, this is Member Syed. Uh, let me thank the. Uh, um, let me thank the department for the presentation and also for the cooperation that we've been having with the SG. I must commend the SG. His phone has been on all the time and he's been consistent in engaging um, um, and trying to find solutions. I just wanted to get a sense. Uh, my my first question, what happens if, um, if schools that are open uh, um, at level four of the lockdown? Um, and the Western Cape or districts at some point move back to level five. Will those schools still remain open, considering that some schools come from um, that some schools come from different districts? And how will this affect the curriculum and the school year? Was that considered? Also, how much um, will the response to COVID-19 cost the department, and where will the money come from? Um, Will all schools in the province have to meet the non-negotiables um, um, before learning can happen at the schools? Uh, when will the Department of Health basically give the go-ahead for the school uh, to receive the SMT and the non-teaching staff on Monday? Because I believe that on Monday they'll be there. Um, what is the department's plan to deal? Okay, no, no, that was covered already. But I just wanted to get a sense. Um, when you've got teachers that will be starting, whether well, that are meant to start on the 1st of June, who've got children who are learners in the uh, in, 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 in grades that are not returning to school, how's that going to be dealt with? Um, then also, uh, okay, we've, we've, there's been a question about the sanitary packs. Um, the other um, question is around the, we've, we've seen that various schools in the province were victims of burglary and vandalism. What is the extent of that damage? Has it been assessed? Who will be responsible for the repairs required? Um, will it be the schools or will it be the department? Also, given that the, that the criminals basically gained um, 
that the, 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 the criminals were at the schools, is this not a reason for the department to, to deep clean schools before Monday, before the SMT return? Because I believe that SMT is supposed to return on Monday. When will the schools be deep cleaned as per the Department of Labor as well as the DPSA regulations? Um, how is the department going to deal with the issue of the overcrowding of schools? Wanted to get it. And then finally, um, in an interview, the, the provincial minister of education mentioned that when the time comes for different grades to return to school, the WECD um, may have to resort to having learners come to class on different days, alternative days. Would learners be expected to learn at home on days um, that they do not come to school? Um, because the national minister noted that the DBE is considering hiring halls and churches to accommodate learners. Has the department looked into that? Um, how does the department plan to monitor social distancing at the schools? Um, then, um, with regards to the nutrition program, um, uh, should draft plans for the phase reopening of schools go ahead? Will the National School Nutrition Program um, basically still be reopened? And will it reopen for, for, for the majority of learners? Or will it only be reopened for those learners who have returned to school um, by those dates? Um, Thank you. Your time has screen... expired. Okay. I'll ask the rest in my second <laughs> place. Thank you. Um, can I just test uh, EFF? Are there any questions? Honorable Trejo, are you on the line? I don't think the EFF is uh, in the meeting at the moment. Um, so then, um, Mr. Schroeder, I don't know if you would prefer to answer the, those questions and then we'll take the remaining two members' questions thereafter, or can we proceed? Uh, I, I'd be quite happy to first uh, respond to that because you have to recognize there are people telling me I'm old and I shouldn't go to work because I'm over 60, so I can't remember so long on all these questions. But I do just want to ask um, Minister Schaefer, are there any that you'd like to kick off with? Yes, there are indeed. I was asked a few questions too and I would like to make comments if that's okay, Chair. Yeah. Yes, please proceed. Thanks. Um, I think Honourable Boyd's first few questions were, were specifically directed to me. Um, is it wise to have schools open on the 1st of June? Um, the question really also could be asked, is it wise not to, given the uh, incredible effect it is having on, on many issues, including the economy, and it links into um, Honourable Syed's question as well. What about teachers whose children aren't going to be back at school? Well, the same question applies to all the essential workers who've been working for the last six weeks while schools have been closed. So it's, it's, it's impacting on everybody. Um, People are trying to go back to work, we're trying to get the economy going, but as long as schools are closed, it's extremely difficult for people who have children. So uh, that is a concern. So, I mean, I think it is wise if it's done in a way that's been proposed as, i.e., only one grade at a time initially to see that we can get it done uh, properly, that we get the proper processes in place. But, of course, that is always subject to the equipment of PPE and so on being available in time. And that is a, a problem that uh, many provinces are having at the moment including us because there's been a huge demand on PPE. Um, so um, I would say if we can get those things in place and the SMTs go to school and help develop the plans that are needed, I think it is quite possible, quite feasible. And even though we are a hotspot at the moment, you know, it's not the entire province. And um, I, I do think it's we, we really need to come with, up with a plan to be able to get back to some semblance of norm normality whilst taking precautions. Um, is there an SAP? Have I engaged with the National Minister? I have quite often, yes. Um, she, um, they are supposed to be developing an SAP, um, and we would prefer to see an, a national one where we can all know where we stand on, on issues. Uh, I know they are busy developing one at DBE, and we are, we are making contributions to that, and we're hoping that will be ready in the next, very hopefully in the next few days. Uh, but it hasn't yet been finalised. Um, fee exemptions, as far as I understand, SG, you can confirm when you answer. Um, people can apply at any point uh, for exemptions if they if they are in financial difficulties. Um, but of course, they must understand we also, you know, we all, we're all subject to the same problem because we're having to divert, you just heard how much we're having to divert towards masks alone, 50 million rand. Um, so that's going to have to come from somewhere. So, but that is a possibility for parents. 
Um, likewise, if they want to apply to be no fee schools, yes, they can they can apply. There is a process, um, but that also depends on us having the available funding to to be able to allow that to happen. Um, but there are processes in place where they can submit applications to our department, our finance directorate, who will assess it uh, on its own merits and in the light of our available budget. PPE delivery, SG, um, as far as I understand, by next week we're expecting it, but he can confirm that. Um, sanitization, we have to just understand what we mean by sanitization. Um, there's no uh, need, we've been told by health, our schools have been closed for six weeks. Um, so virus does not last for six weeks. We've been given that assurance by the health department. Where we've been doing feeding, obviously that raises some concerns, but we have been cleaning um, those areas anyway, obviously for safety reasons. And I hear what Honourable Said says about uh, where we had burglaries and vandalism. I mean, that may be something we'll have to look at SG, but it certainly isn't every single school in the province. So for us to go and do a deep clean of every school in the province is going to waste very, very much needed resources. So we certainly will be cleaning schools, absolutely, um, which we would do anyway after the uh, at the end of a long uh, holiday or break. Uh, but uh, to to do a deep clean where there hasn't been any cases of COVID at all um, is is not we are advised by health essential or necessary. Um, overcrowding SG, I'd like to hear what you're going to do about that. But yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> the reality is. Unless we get more teachers and more classrooms, we can't uh, deal with that issue um, other than by staggering and, and as I mentioned um, in my interview, referred to by Honourable side, um, perhaps having to have different classes on different days. Because uh, if we could reduce the numbers, we would have done so by now already. And the reason we haven't is because we simply haven't had the budget. So um, there's a lot of money that's needed. To, uh, we, there are huge amounts of money um, being, in, you know, incurred as a result of this COVID epidemic, um, unfortunately. Um, as far as the school halls and uh, hiring halls and churches of concern, uh, it's the first I've heard of it. Um, SG, I'm not sure if you've had that discussion with the, with the DG from DBE. Uh, but even if we do that, we need to have teachers. And uh, so we're waiting for DBE because they will then have to allocate funding for that because we certainly don't have it uh, at the moment. Um, if the West Cape goes back a level, um, I we obviously have had those discussions, but there's no firm decision. But our understanding is that, uh, you know, if there are particular hotspots uh, like we have in some areas of the Western Cape, those schools may well have to close or stay closed. Uh, and we'll have to assess it as it goes on because there, but there's some areas where we don't have one single case, but those schools have been closed for six weeks. So I, I think that we will have to be open to the possibility of some areas closing for a certain time. And obviously in terms of the protocol, if there is a case or cases at school and health advises us that a school needs to be closed for cleaning, for example, that will also have to be taken into account. And then catch up plans will, will need to be developed for that. Um, I think that's all from my side, SG, if I can hand over to you for the rest. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, um, the only comment I'd like to make about should schools reopen or not, uh, Member Buerta, is um, if you listen to Professor Karim, uh, who is the uh, principal advisor to the president, uh, he made a very excellent um, presentation or comment the other day in a message that I heard. Um, and he, he made the point that, in fact, the pandemic, a global pandemic, is going to be with us. And and uh, if you were to be able to lock up everyone forever, you might find uh, within months that the pandemic is gone. But that's not possible because then society will go to, to pot. And so the issue about is it safe for schools reopening is based on the knowledge that, in fact, uh, young people are not the most prone to, that's health advice, not uh, susceptible to the virus. Um, teachers are more susceptible to it, but but teachers are more susceptible outside of school to it in, as I said, shopping centers uh, or, or, or shops or grocery shops or, or petrol stations and others that health often mentions is more so. And Professor Karim makes the point that, you know, life has to go on and when does life go on? Um, uh, and so I think Minister made a point about that. Is it, isn't it? Uh, and what about the loss? Um, and I think 
part of the challenge at the moment is people's perception of managing the pandemic and the fact that there will be people infected and people that die. That's a reality. Uh, it's a harsh reality. Um, but schooling, the opening of schooling is not deemed to be a particular contributor to that aspect. Uh, other opening or, or loosening might be. Yes, special training um, is intended. The, the, once again, we dependent on the DBE who has been for, for many weeks developing materials that have not been forthcoming as yet. They in drafts or final drafts, we've inputted into them. There is an orientation program that uh, will be available for teachers. Um, and uh, I, the special training is, a, is an interesting question because it implies that someone knows and must tell someone else how to do it. But, but our teachers are professionals that can read and the programs and the actions are quite clear. But we will make sure with the district supporting teachers that they are able to um, understand what is required of them uh, and what the processes are. Minister made reference to the SOP. We've also started to develop our own guidelines in the absence of a national operating procedure. And also uh, sometimes the content of what goes into that has been, there's so much, there's such a bombardment of information that it causes more confusion than clarity of action and purpose. Um, and I think they're still struggling a little bit with that. Yes, we would say that uh, people must apply. And remember fee exemption, Parents apply for fee exemption if they can't pay the school fees. And they, they, it must be evidenced on financial position. And that enables schools then to request from us at a given point in time for compensation for their loss of fees. Um, and, and that compensation is dependent on what is available to us to do so. So we certainly encourage parents in the first place to pay school fees because costs are ongoing. Um, but we also recognize that there are parents that are really having a tough time. And if they can't, then they should apply for fee exemptions. Um, the no fee school at this stage, again, we're not encouraging midstream because for every additional no fee school that you create, you have to make some other one a fee paying because there's an existing amount that goes around that in the budgetary planning process. The issue of over 60s, um, the um, national minister um, has issued a draft um, direction, which is not out yet, uh, that is based on health input, which is a very good input, also information that we get from our Department of Health. But I, I want it to be finally published before I um, send it to schools um, for them to apply. I think the intention is that just because you're over 60 doesn't make you more vulnerable. Um, it maybe uh, has certain impacts, but if you are, um, have over 60 or under 60 and have a comorbidity, those comorbidities are defined. It's not just high blood pressure. It defines what level of high blood pressure. If it's diabetes, it's what type and what extent. If it's a, a, a renal challenges, it says what the count is. So, and it has to be backed with, uh, with not only a sick certificate, but a medical history. Um, from a medical practitioner. Uh, and I have a feeling that it could have a marked impact uh, on the education system um, and, uh, and also in our own space. We've asked schools to identify them. It's one of the reasons why you need um, an, a senior management team at school so that they are able to address the number of issues that have to be prepared before teachers and others come. And one of these is getting a list of, of, uh, of potentially vulnerable teachers um, and how we manage that space. PPE deliverables, Minister has mentioned, these things are ordered from different places, so the deliveries will not be in one slap bang. Uh, sanitizers have already been delivered to some schools and it's expected Monday. We've asked that the majority of deliveries be in next week because then people will be at school. Um, and uh, both those and masks, uh, liquid soap, uh, et cetera, um, those um, aspects will be there. There's also sometimes a bit of a misunderstanding about PPEs or what it means um, and what you require and what you don't require. Um, Minister commented on the sanitization of classrooms and hostels. Um, I, I want to say again that all information is that deep cleaning is not necessary because the virus does not survive. It's more of a psychological thing than a real medical issue. Thorough cleaning, like after a long holiday, is required. And that is why we need the cleaning staff back before teachers go back in bulk. Um, 
And so the staged um, return is a sensible one. And, and um, uh, it is those people that must then prepare the issues, the cleanliness and the safety, and there will be a guideline for cleaning. Um, that uh, that is made available as well with with ideas about uh, what could be called deep cleaning because it's extra cleaning. It's not the normal cleaning because uh, the cleaning of schools doesn't always necessarily uh, focus on the areas of high uh, potential um, um, of viral uh, collection, if you like. And in this cleaning guidelines indicate those must happen. Similarly, school hostels must also be cleaned uh, by the cleaning staff in school hostels before learners come. Um, uh, Minister made reference to the hotspot areas. I just want to say that what I had said to the system so far is that if there is an area or a province or a sector or whatever, but if there's an area, municipality, municipal area, whatever, that is uplifted to lockdown level five, then in my view, that means the schools in that area must close and I will then instruct the schools to close in that area. Um, but there's a different matter that's related to that complexity, namely, and that means that teachers don't go to teach there anymore because the schools will be closed under lockdown five, as had been in lockdown five. But there could be teachers that live in that broad area who teach elsewhere, and they will get permits to go teach in the place where they teach out of level five, just as during lockdown five, there were people with special permits to travel and do essential work. We would have it in the same way. The only requirement that I would have is that all teachers, and especially therefore those teachers, will be screened before they enter a school to make sure that there are no issues um, that potentially that they, that they can potentially uh, bring in infection into the school. Um, and that is quite in line also with my conversations with the Department of Health. Um, the plan for social distancing that Minister asks me to <laughs> manage. <laughs> if one or two or even three grades return in a phased in approach over a period of a month and a half, then schools can make plans where classes are large in those sections to double the classes or to spread them across two classes or to teach them in a hall if they want to because the school is not fully populated. So this, the ability to manage social distancing is then possible. But the moment you get to four um, grades or more, then it is no longer possible to have social distancing. And in that instance, unless health, as they have indicated, might waive the social distancing for school context, provided every learner is screened every day, and every learner has the safety mechanisms, masks and clean hands, they might waive the, the, the social distancing. The social distancing has almost become a Bible because it is the one thing that, that helps dramatically. But in the school context, that's not possible to run a school. Now, unfortunately, there have been comments made um, um, by various agencies nationally and elsewhere um, that you can just build extra classes or even do platooning. But that means you need more teachers, or it means teachers do double shifts, or it means that you need to put on classes. And this province has not been able to deal with the influx into this province with the budget that it has. Hence, our schools are overcrowded. Not because we can't manage, we don't have the money that is associated with the growth in our learner population. So the reality is that if social distancing is a continued requirement after about two months or so of phasing, then we will not be able to continue with schooling in this province. That's, that's a reality. Um, and I say that because the expectations that it's possible is not possible. The idea of hiring additional halls, again, it is an ill-conceived idea. I'm not sure where it is stated, but let me just cite an example. So you hire a school hall or a church hall, and you put learners in it, but you don't have full control over that hall because there's also other factors, uh, for example, community feeding, et cetera, in it. You don't have control over the safety, the security, the hygiene of areas that are not enclosed within the school premises. And so it's not a, it's not a sensible um, uh, solution to it. It is far more a solution to the other COVID-19 needs within a community, such as place where you feed people, place where you might isolate people, etc. 
it's not an educational solution um, as, a, as an automatic uh, case in my view. Um, then um, the, um, uh, the COVID-19 safety rigs, um, both uh, training, there will be uh, training manuals and orientation manuals that are available for it before learners come back. In fact, I would want it ready before the bulk of teachers come back. Again, your senior staff in schools are the ones that have to manage the space. Uh, hence, you need them back to prepare and be able to orientate teachers when they come on it. And the monitoring of those uh, aspects will be the district's responsibility to monitor. <coughs> I want to reiterate though, that the principal of a school is an accountable official and must be held accountable for running his or her school. Um, but the monitoring of that space will be done by, by district officials and, and other uh, monitoring agencies. And we would ask municipalities, we would ask um, um, uh, other community organizations, et cetera, to assist uh, in monitoring. Um, the um, uh, aspect of hostels. Um, now, again, DBE has not given clear guidance on the hostel. Our thinking on the hostel matter is that a hostel is like a house. People in a house live together, kids in a hostel live together. And you must make sure that when they come into the hostel that they are screened, when they come back from weekends, et cetera, and not be allowed in the hostel if there are any of the, of the indicators um, present. And every day, like kids that go into a school, they must be screened as well when they go to school. So you have early warning of any potential challenges. If there is a case, a hostel, particularly when you've got a degree of phased in approach, then that means the hostel won't be fully full and there can be a degree of social distancing and you can have isolation space in it until learners can be collected and then you can uh, make um, a sanitizing and deep cleaning of that space uh, if necessary. So these are, are issues that we have had discussed and we have had conversations on. We've spoken to principals of schools with hostels about it um, to get the best possible solution to the space. Um, uh, the standard operating procedure or guideline procedure, uh, Member Buerta does make um, clear indication of what you do if there is a COVID case or a suspected COVID case or a confirmed COVID case. The aspects are different in each case. And when you have a confirmed case, it does not mean, according to health regulations, that the school must close down. Um, it is only if there are multiples that you need to close a school. Uh, if there's a suspected case, obviously that particular case must isolate and any with direct contact. And there's a clear definition of what direct contact means. It means those who had touched them or hugged them. Those who are in the same room are casual contacts and need to be monitored, but do not need to isolate until such time um, as you might think that there are, are symptoms or they have symptoms. Those guidelines in the health context is clear um, at the moment and they will be, um, uh, schools will have them before any learner comes back and, and get oriented in the context of those. Um, <clears throat> there also with cases, uh, whilst the health department is and will be tremendously strained in the next months, um, community health workers and others will play a role in assisting uh, if there are such cases. And we have a, uh, uh, we've uh, had a conversation about what the uh, reporting mechanism is and how the decision making structure or tree is to take uh, decisions in such an instance and, and when it happens. Um, again, um, ad hoc decision making due to potential fear factors creates more fear um, and is often uh, not necessary. So it needs to be very clear, very precise and consistent uh, in the managing and decision taking in the space. Um, independent schools, we've not had applications for them to remain open. They don't have to apply to us. Independent schools are independent. Even if we subsidize them, they are subsidized on certain conditions, but we don't control um, the running of the independent schools. Um, it, it is uh, incumbent on the national minister in her directions to make sure that she includes them also in what she indicates, but it's not a provincial uh, competence to do so. Um, I'm going to ask Sally um, Abrams just to comment on how we deal with the infrastructure program given the break uh, of COVID-19. Sally, um, the chair, may I ask him to come in on this one quickly? Yes, please proceed. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, honourable members, Minister, uh, Chair. Uh, my inputs uh, are insofar as the infrastructure response plan uh, is concerned. Um, first and foremost, the, the extended um, closure of schools have brought with it uh, a number of immediate uh, challenges and priorities to respond to. Um, we've been communicating uh, in various forums that we've counted to date 88 cases of vandalism and theft. And so that's the immediate um, challenge that we needed to assess. Um, we have determined from those that we were able to glean from the information provided whilst assessments continue, identify 43 projects that we will um, endeavour to mobilise a team around to get um, uh, restoration done and minimum functionality restored before schools open um, on the scenario of a 1st June um, um, reopening. Those 43 projects um, range in terms of its um, the extent of damage. They are typically um, extensive vandalism cases and or uh, break-ins and attempted theft where uh, structural damage has been caused. These are not cases where uh, motor gates, uh, motors for gates have been stolen or fences. These are um, cases where classrooms and or uh, important admin facilities have been broken into and needs uh, restoration. So we have prioritized emergency maintenance um, to within the context of those 88 incidents. A further 12 incidents of um, water leakages, significant water disruptions um, are going to be attended to. Um, in conjunction with the with the school, um, there are some activities that uh, the school will handle, um, but the structural issues again we will tackle. Uh, second to the emergency maintenance would be our uh, ensuring that there is sufficient water and sanitation um, facilities available at schools. Now it's well documented that with the increased enrollment, we have a, a shortage of ablution facilities as it relates to the regulations uh, regarding the minimum norms and standards. Um, we do believe that the situation is manageable in the Western Cape. We don't have a, a, uh, a situation where any school is without water. All our schools are with water. We count three schools, three mobile schools that we've activated in 2020 um, that do not have permanent connections or sufficient and stable water supply. And we will mobilize a number of uh, options. We will deploy uh, standpipe uh, tankers, but also mobilize tanker services to distribute potable water. So water and sanitation is our second priority in that regard. We will then um, uh, progress uh, scheduled maintenance activities that were uh, suspended during the lockdown. And I make that point because some of those activities, whilst building works continues, may present a risk with scaffolding and other facilities being in place, and that will uh, contribute to the risk scenario for a 1 June opening. So those are the three priorities and to member Boata's question around how does this impact the infrastructure agenda um, in two ways, um, um, honourable member. One is we are have checked with National Treasury and, and consider that the education infrastructure grant um, would uh, make provision for hygiene and other facilities. And so there's a consideration around budget reprioritization where the impact is uh, as far as possible will be minimized, but we consider there's one a budget reprioritization aspect to it. But secondly, the prioritization of these activities over and above the capital works projects might indicate a, a delay. Uh, and certainly as we think about augmenting capacity to the extent that we can, and I'd like to come back to that, um, we might have to reprioritize on the infrastructure projects in our um, annual uh, annual plan. But it is being managed in that structured way and um, the details of of those activities and the numbers of um, uh, projects will will be clarified in the days and weeks ahead. Um, I would add that as our focus is on restoring minimum functionality, we have also and the SG has made the point um, been challenged with the space issue. And so the infrastructure agenda covers multiple contexts. First and foremost, as a place of teaching and learning, we are working with curriculum in the context of the scenario of phasing back grades, working on the requirements, particularly for grade 12 and 7. 7 is easy because 7 matches the class, group matches the, the class on a standard curriculum. Grade 12s, of course, are based on subjects, um, specializations and choices. And so the determination of space requirements relative to the 140,000 children in the Western Cape that will go back on 1 June we are working with districts and schools to 
model a scenario for how we propose to manage the infrastructure challenges from day one. On day one, as I said, for grades 12 and 7, we've modeled on a 25, a 1 to 25 um, ratio. That is in line with trying to use a 48 square meter classroom um, and maintain a one and a half meter distance. If that um, regulation is maintained, we would have to go on a one to 25 scenario. And for grades 12 and seven, we would need at least 1,600 classrooms. Again, a sizable challenge. And uh, whilst we don't think we'll provision necessarily for grade 12 and seven, as the SG says, if the scenario continues, the grades 11 and 10 and, 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 and equally six and five goes back in the staggered approach, there will be a point one and a half months into this program where we clearly will not be able to accommodate and maintain um, the learners on that on that particular regime. And so grades eight and nines in the high school will be our breaking point in some contexts in our metro districts, even grade 10. So we don't envisage being able to maintain that beyond the grade 10 level. But this is about um, also using the context of infrastructure, not just for teaching and learning. It's also a workplace for teachers. And so we're working with the uh, uh, IDC, the Institutional Development and Coordination Branch on cleaning and on monitoring, Honorable Member Bota, to your question and, and Honorable Member site on how will we monitor. Infrastructure will take responsibility and are uh, providing clarity and guidelines on the spatial demarcations as it relates to queuing for things like feeding and assemblies should that proceed. Not all schools have school halls and we will physically mark out as many schools have taken the initiative to do. Mark out um, lineup areas and other um, queuing and, and aggregation points uh, in the way that we maintain um, the, the discipline with maintaining the distance and guide school principals and management teams in that regard. As a workplace, we are ensuring that the cleaning happens to the extent that we, we believe is, is appropriate. And of course, we am covered by the comments by the minister and the SG in that regard. Um, but cleaning and sanitization is important. We have strengthened our controls around ensuring that as a workplace, that of course, the National Department of uh, Labor and Department of Health regulations apply. And so as it pertains to the screening of individuals accessing the schools, our screening process will be covered in the protocol or the SOP that we will either adopt from the DBE and or augment from our side. And that includes, of course, contractor staff from the Department of Public Works and other agencies. And that's the other reason why there might be concern around um, managing the the re-entry, if you like, of construction activities and infrastructure activities, we do consider this a workplace. And then as I lead to conclusion, just on the um, designated areas, should there be post the screening process cases of um, illness, we do have at some schools, not all, sick bay facilities. We will extend that and repurpose other safe spaces potentially, should that be needed. Uh, we are going to uh, think about our different contexts, ranging from the overcrowded metro school to the lesser populated um, uh, farming school context. We are thinking about a designated space for activities to be monitored in this context of managing this particular infection. And then I, I conclude on the point, um, uh, Honourable Member Said's point, just looking at the, the vandalism, the, the point is we will want to prioritize um, not just as we would have done prior to COVID, um, not just the um, restoration of our facilities impacted, but we would have embarked in the Western Cape context in our safety plan context on a um, more uh, assertive um, security program to fence up. And so we will put monies to that to uh, bolster and make sure that the facilities um, in particularly cordoned of areas are protected. That would be the extent of our infrastructure uh, response. Um, quite, uh, there's more detail to add, but I'll be led by the questions, um, Chair, um, and by the honorable members. Thank you very much, hope that suffices. Thanks, thanks Chair. Just a few more, uh, if you'll allow me, please. Um, uh, a question about, um, have we been approached to avail hostels? The answer is yes, we have, and uh, at various stages by various groups for various reasons. And we've given a consistent response that we're not able to do that 
um, because if schools are to open, we can't have hostels then utilized for quarantine or for isolation or for any other purposes. Uh, the exception is uh, one hostel that's not being used at all and can be cordoned off that uh, was potentially made available, not utilized yet. And then uh, we must also remember parents' perspectives if hostels were used in this case. What we did say was that if the national minister decided for an extended period of two to four months for schools to remain closed, then we'll, of course, reconsider and make those facilities available. Point also to remember, though, is that all that a hostel has is besides the hostel, it's got a bed and a mattress and a cupboard. It doesn't have bedding, pillows, toiletries or anything else. All of that will then have to be acquired. Um, so it's not an easy, simple matter that it is available um, as a hotel or B&B might be. So just to say that we've had that consistent approach. Then um, the cost for COVID-19 members said um, at the moment, approximately 200 million uh, repurposed. Uh, there are different aspects related to this. Uh, the, the 200 million uh, so far has just been for the materials. Uh, I made reference to the masks, 50 million just for, for masks. Uh, 200 million is the um, is the material, the PP PPEs. Um, those costs will no doubt increase. That does not include the digital costs because that comes out of digital budgets, re repurposed and redirected budgets. Um, the aspect about non-negotiables, the answer to that is a cautious yes, because there are different people who have different views of what are non-negotiables. But the safety non-negotiables we will we will obviously adhere to, and the, the directives we will adhere to. Uh, and Department of Health's go-ahead is clear for us. Uh, we, we're in constant contact with the Department of Health on a daily basis, um, and uh, certainly that is part of our uh, conversation. Um, the the question that you asked about the children of teachers that might come back that are in lower grades, I think Minister Schaefer has responded to that. My addition to that just is it is uh, we can't we can't be everything for everyone. Um, and and the role that parents have to play um, if they need to go back to work uh, to to get a salary is that that they need to make arrangements for for their children. I've got great sympathy with that but we also can't bring those children to school. It adds to the issue of other parents and other teachers and other, and other learners. At the same time, you can't say teachers can stay at home and get paid um, uh, because of this dilemma that they have. So a cautious response is that like everyone else that works, we've got to try to make arrangements for, for whatever is required at home. Um, the, um, the extent of, da of damage, I think um, um, Salah Abrams has spoken really to that at the moment. That's part of the reason why people have to go back. We've not sent teams in, in lockdown to extend that. Uh, indications are that there's not deep extents of damage in this province like schools having burnt down or anything of that nature. Um, there are two or three robberies. Um, uh, and other than that, it's, it's, it's external or superficial vandalism generally. But the costing will be done once uh, we have uh, our SMTs back to be able to gauge that. Um, <laughs> the dealing with the overcrowding of schools I've more or less spoken to um, and indicate what can and cannot be done and when it is possible and when not. Um, the, um, the question about um, alternative grades. Um, we've looked at all kinds of options. We've considered extending the day, and I've commented on that before. We've looked at alternative days and have kids come to school half the time. So they come on every second day or so with grade 12s all the time. Uh, we understand that that adds further to lost curriculum time and lost learning time. Um, and that might have to come about if you want to bring everyone back but you can't because of the overcrowding. So you might then have half a school back at the time and half a school at home in alternative days. Those are possibilities that uh, are available if, uh, if it comes to that point. Um, how, uh, however, uh, I say again, the waiving of the uh, so-called social distancing norms for learners in a school context in a work environment could change. Um, we know that in all current places, work environment, social distancing doesn't always work when people have to pick up the same heavy carton, for example, in a retail space uh, and so forth. Um, I've spoken about the halls and churches. Um, and 
the one thing that you've asked, uh, it's the last thing, Chair, that I need to answer at the moment, and that is the question of nutrition. When, when school starts being phased in, what do we do with nutrition? In our view, we will feed those learners that are at school. In other words, when learners start coming back to school, we'll have the normal nutrition program in place. In other words, the learners that are at school will be fed at school. The learners that aren't yet back, we will not suddenly now stop feeding them because they've come in, the, in this interim period. We'll continue feeding them, but in a way that there is no mixing with learners. They will not come when the break time. They will eat at the, at the circumference where they eat, um, not anywhere near the school building or in the school building, etc. So the arrangements will be so that we still feed uh, the kids um, going forward um, and still continue those kids that um, don't go because they can't get to it, either farm schools or or uh, commuter school kids, for example, will still suggest that they go to their nearest school and make arrangements that the, that the delivery amounts or so that we feed maximum number of kids that qualify. Thank you, Chair. That covers the first round. Thank you very much uh, to all uh, to yourself and the Minister and other departmental officials. Um, I'm now going to recognise the ACDP. Are there any questions? Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to the Minister and the HOD. Um, just my question, Chair, is um, uh, did the department think about the transport where you are now not allowed to have uh, the, uh, the vehicles packed to capacity? Um, how is that going to impact uh, the transporting of learners to, to schools? I think it's 70% or so that you can fill up. Uh, did the department think of that? Another question, Chair, is that... Um, uh, I see some of the independent schools has now switched over to Microsoft Team, like we did. Uh, schools that can afford it, uh, you know, is is they thinking uh, of of maybe switching over? Uh, especially, uh, I'm also thinking schools that can afford it, but also especially your hotspot areas. We now know um, uh, in the in the metro, the hotspot areas outside the metro, Central Guru is nothing. And Garden Road is fine, Overberg is fine, but in the in the in the in the metro itself, there are certain hot spot areas, Mitchell's Plain and Noon. I can mention all of them. Uh, do you think of alternative ways? Because SG has uh, has mentioned that people will be screened, but some of the people and some of uh, people don't have the symptoms at all. Uh, uh, so so uh, and and they feel fine, but yet they are infected. How do you deal? with situations where 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 children or, or teachers may be infected but they don't have the symptoms at all because i also know that um we are we are um at a bottleneck of testing because uh, as political leaders uh, we are meeting with the pre uh, premier this morning and he said there's a bottleneck of testing we do a lot of testing in 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 the western cape but there's no a bottleneck and uh, also in the meeting this morning, he said that by the end, as now by the end of June, that we're looking at 80,000 infections per week. Uh, so that uh, that peak must still come. So that's why I'm talking about especially hot spot areas. How do you maybe looking at alternative measures? Another important thing, of course, that we are very well worried about is our pass rate. How will this infect, uh, you know, affect our pass rate? Because now we must also remember, and I know what the SG said, we're not looking at catching up, we're looking at core value teaching and all of that, but how, how will this affect us? And do we have enough time to teach what we need to teach? Because especially for your um, matriculants going into tertiary institutions now, um, you know, will they have the same opportunity to get admission uh, to the tertiary institutions uh, with, the, with the education uh, they are receiving. And I know that uh, tertiary institution is not a provincial competency, but surely there must be discussions with higher education uh, to look at these these things going forward because we want to give our, our learners the opportunity to have uh, tertiary education. Uh, maybe um, another thing, uh, uh, Chairperson, that is very important, uh, schools has now schools has now lost uh, income because uh, many schools use their halls for entertainment, for church, and all of that. So that's an extra burden on schools now. And uh, many of these schools uh, have um, SGB post, uh, and they rely on extra income. Will the department uh, look at that? 
when it comes to that. And also, t- uh, uh, every day we get um, we get uh, uh, messages and stuff of people uh, that's losing their jobs because it's not so sad. It's a small business uh, hairdressers. So people are losing their jobs. So I think the need for food and nutrition is going to become bigger on the department. I know we only have that budget, but that's all the complaints when we, um, uh, and I want to say, uh, when I spoke to people in Manenberg, uh, as you are 100% correct, um, people showed me that uh, teachers are communicating on WhatsApp messages, and uh, if somebody don't have a phone, they will go over to go assist. And you know, our copies has been collected, and all. So, so that's what's happening, and 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 I'm very glad with that. But there is those Thank areas you. of concern that we have. Thank you, Chairperson. <laughs> Thank you. Time has expired. Um, uh, thank you. I recognize the Freedom Front Plus. Honorable Maria, are you on the line? I don't think Honorable Maria is on the line. Uh, given so, I'm then just going to ask the three parties that are, if they'd like to ask any final questions um, as we are um, running out of time. So, uh, uh, members, if you have any final burning questions, if you could pose them in um, less than a minute, please. Uh, I'll start with the DA. Thank you, Chairperson. SG, with regards to the school's obligation in terms of the uh, in terms of the municipality, um, the um, um, you know the payment of mon- uh, utilities. Um, is the department in discussion with municipalities as to pertaining to that? And then in regard to school governing bodies, how has the department ensured that they were taken along on this journey in order to amplify the correctly informed message? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, ANC? Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Member Sayed, yeah? Um, thank you for the responses. Um, I just wanted to know if, whether I heard correctly on the issue of the teachers that are 60 years of age and above, that not all of them are at risk. I just wanted confirmation of that. Then also, who will screen the, um, the senior management teachers on Monday? And when will the CM or district staff be there to screen the SMT and the non-teaching staff? Um, also, what are the expectations of school safety committees in keeping schools COVID-19 compliant once learners return to schools? If so, how is WC, uh, um, uh, if so, how does WCD plan to support um, this uh, process? Um, then, uh, with regards to the cigarettes that are now available on the black market, I just wanted to get a sense what measures will be put in place around smoking at schools. Um, <laughs> some of the more stringent measures. Uh, Thank then you. Also, whether, um, whether there will be deep cleaning in schools um, that house learners in hostels. Um, and will WCD also employ additional cleaning staff for deep cleaning and sanitizing of schools? Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Said. And um, then, Honourable Christians, um, would you like to pose any further questions? Just, 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 just a, a small one. Uh, just, uh, what is the department doing with our students that are struggling? Because, of course, it's going to be uh, difficult on them now. Um, it's tr- I'm talking about uh, students that in the mainstream that is struggling, those on the borderline. I know we had this discussion, but is that continuing, uh, assisting them, supporting them in order to 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 make the grade at the end of, of, of the term? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, members, for those questions. Um, HOD, Minister, uh, over to you. Minister. Thank you, um, Chair and SG. Um, I think most of those questions really um, are for the SG to answer. Um, I'm not sure if I misheard Honourable side about deep cleaning. We've already dealt with the deep cleaning issue. Um, and then as far as the cigarettes are concerned, I um, trust that was a facetious comment. Um, as far as um, the SGB issue is concerned, it is a concern, obviously, that many parents aren't able to pay school fees. Um, there are some parents that are saying they shouldn't be paying school fees now anyway because their children haven't been at school and they've been teaching them. So whatever we do, we can't really win. But um, the, the fact of the matter is some 
to, some schools do employ extra SGB teachers and others would love to do that, but they don't, they don't have the funds to do that. So it's quite a difficult issue for the department for us to then say, well, we'll help out the schools that have SGB teachers, um, whereas others aren't able to, in fact, appoint them in the first place. So I think we might run into some problems then, but we are we are looking to see if there's any way we can assist uh, poorer schools who who maybe have appointed SGB teachers who haven't been able to um, to pay them. Uh, but there's I don't think there's any way that we can pay all of we, all those SGB uh, appointments. Um, I think then other issues really the. Issue of honourable side, it, it is so. I mean, health has advised us that just because you're over 60 doesn't mean you're high risk. You've got to be over 60 plus have comorbidities. And likewise, there can be people under 60 who are high risk because they have certain conditions. So we need to look at so what we really need to do is look at every school, which is why the SMT needs to go back to make sure that they identify people who are in those categories so we can put um, risk measures in place to to um, ensure that they are kept as safe as possible. But we are having constant discussions with health on the, on those issues. Estri, can I hand over to you for the rest of the questions? Thank you, Minister. Um, first of all, um, Member Christians, uh, transport the capacity, just like the waiving of the 1.5 in schools was through a national process, asked of the National Department of Health to consider that, uh, otherwise, schools across this nation can't really operate. We've also asked that in the transport context, if buses are cleaned and every learner has hand sanitized before they get onto a bus and wears a mask, whether the um, uh, capacity can't be reconsidered for schooling. Now, the Minister of Transport has not yet uh, come out on that. Uh, he has passed regulations for others, bringing it to 70%. He's indicated that the schooling needs a different uh, way of thinking, but he's not yet brought out a regulation on that space. Similarly, if we are bound to 70%, it means we can't transport all of the kids. We already pay 412 million rand uh, on transport every year. Um, and um, we have uh, about 60, 66,000 children that we have to um, uh, transport. And there is simply not a way that you can add 30% to the transport. It's just not, not um, doable. Um, then um, the issue about MS teams, um, it's, it's possible. Look, the hotspot areas, and we've indicated that part of that is we, we will always go forward in a blended learning approach. Where we can, such as with, with WhatsApp and Wi-Fi, we'll utilize that. Uh, we for a long time argued that uh, schools ought to be utilizing cell phones more because of kids' uh, innate um, aptitude to technology. Uh, instead of banning it, utilize it for learning and not just for social learning, but also for academic learning. But it's one of the reasons why we also um, need to make sure that we have uh, paper-based uh, engagement and paper-based resources and why we've had that double approach going forward. Um, and also uh, encouraging the Western Cape government to uh, add to its um, Wi-Fi hotspot, not um, COVID hotspot, but Wi-Fi hotspot space so that uh, um, access can be expanded uh, for poor learners. Um, the issue of pass rate and the time to teach, the whole intent is that the, that the metrics, if they do come back, um, there is a possibility to ensure that they are in line. There is conversation with higher education, both in this province, but also nationally. Um, and um, again, it's something that has to be managed flexibly going forward. Uh, there is a conversation about uh, writing the matric exams a little bit later, maybe November, December instead of October, um, to give us a bit more time to have learners prepared uh, the best possible way. Uh, but uh, the higher education sector is also acutely aware of the, of the issues and the challenges. Um, and they will utilize other resources as well uh, for access to learners, such as, for example, the access tests, which they have used in the past in certain regards. But we will do everything in a powerful matrix. Also, the, um, the, the learners that are slightly struggling um, uh, or or that have maybe not done so well, we will continue with our plans as we do every year um, for uh, intensive programs, including possibly Saturday programs for learners who are struggling. We have on record, as we do every year, identified every individual learner in matric that has come through with challenges, either because they progressed or have not got a good pass. 
Uh, we've identified every subject for every learner. So the data is pinpointing exactly what is needed. Uh, and that will aid us in a short space of time to put the most intensive support for those learners that we can possibly do. Doesn't mean that it will not impact on metric results. But there has also at the national level been conversation with Uma Lucy so that there's an understanding about those challenges that lie ahead. Um, and uh, uh, also where I am part of those conversations, we will continue to make sure that sound and sensible decisions get taken in the interests of the learners. This is pandemic is not learners fault. Therefore, they shouldn't be penalized and we have to do the best that we can possibly do for them. Um, the the issue about the, uh, the, the payment of utilities, um, we've had the conversation around um, that matter. We are in a weekly basis. Uh, the provincial top management is in a weekly basis with all municipal managers. Um, and the matter will be raised again. We also have to recognize, though, that municipalities themselves are under pressure. There's no one that isn't under financial pressure going forward. Um, and the demands that are put on municipalities is also tough. We'll have to find a balance in that space. But we will continue with a comment, maybe, um, payment, uh, payment holiday, payment extensions, etc. cetera, um, uh, when, when the, um, the problems hit the, hit the space. Now, we're taking governing bodies along two ways. Um, we have, I've had uh, ongoing and continuous conversations with all role players, public service unions, all teacher unions, principal associations, our provincial principals forum, uh, and governing body foundations. I've also met uh, with uh, with uh, all of them in a variety of spaces at least three times uh, in the last uh, month. Um, and I also include governing bodies in every letter that I write to school. I expect the letters that I write must also go to governing bodies. And I've written a range of letters to be able to try to keep our schools and our governing bodies as informed as possible about events, even where we sit in the situation where we do, where we have to take difficult decisions. For example, a decision about um, Monday's return and what happens, etc. If I listen to what's happening across the nation, it needs reflection. Um, and then um, um, ministers responded about the over 60. Um, who will screen on Monday? Uh, well, first of all, the when you go back on Monday, you go back with a small group of people. That small group of people can be so socially distanced because they can sit on opposite sides of a staff room or a hall and they go back with masks and sanitizers already available. So the screening will kick in. You need to train people to do the screening. We've asked, of course, whether health can do it and health says there's no hope at all <laughs> that they can screen in 1,500. They've not got the resources and the people. So our own people have to screen. Screen is not a medically technical matter. It's a question of four questions that people have to answer. And using thermometers are not required by health, but it is an additional um, methodology that we've put in in the education sector to make doubly sure. Largely because adults are able to say, I've got an incessant cough now, or I haven't, or I have a fever, or I haven't. Kids can't always do that, particularly young kids. Hence the need for, uh, for also the external um, screening thermometers. But it's not a requirement generally for health. So uh, people can also do the screening check one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, how do you respond to these questions? How do I respond to these questions, et cetera? Um, the support for, I, I didn't quite catch this, uh, Member Syed. I think the support for COVID-19 committee and how will districts support that, uh, um, similar to monitoring districts, district officials, et cetera, will monitor schools. The circuit manager is the first link with schools. Uh, I might have missed that question, so please help me if, I, if I'm wrong on that. Um, and I'm not going to comment on the cigarette black market. Um, uh, I'm, I, I don't quite know why it's forefront in your mind, but um, I'm uh, similarly in the same vein, I'm far more worried, of course, by drugs than, than cigarettes in school. Cigarettes is not, the, uh, is not what kids use at this time. Uh, uh, it's the it's the matter of drugs that is the, the biggest issue in our schools. Um, and then um, the question of additional cleaning staff, I just want to comment on this quickly. The um, um, f Firstly, we are trying to get an understanding about what is the scale and scope of uh, 
both officials with comorbidities and teachers with comorbidities. Once we have that list, we'll understand how many um, there is a need for, and we will do everything in our power to have appropriate safety and caring for those officials. It might mean that we have to um, employ substitutes. And so the 200 million that uh, I spoke about earlier that I got from Leon Eli can be far in excess of that if we have to substitute every teacher. Remember, a teacher can't teach from home. They can't do the job from home. So the nature of the teaching job is actually that they need to be in the classroom with learners. But if there are cases that are clearly indicated um, with uh, severe comorbidities in the ranges that are there, we have to find a caring solution to that. So we've indicated to uh, our schools already uh, and to all the, um, the role players that we will increase and um, uh, slacken the requirements to apply for substitutes and we will replace substitutes quicker. The financial implications of that will be significant. Um, and we already, ha we already have identified the pools of potential substitutes, unemployed teachers, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the last question, Jay, is you asked about the cleaners and extra cleaning, cleaning staff. In the Western Cape, we're fortunate to have cleaners in all our schools. That doesn't seem to be the case across the country. And when we speak on the national scale and the conversations that I hear my colleagues say, um, I, I'm, I'm greatly challenged at times. Now, the national DG has indicated that um, the potential is there for provinces to also get cleaners uh, from the Department of Public Works uh, in the uh, EPWP program. Now, yesterday on uh, about the third one-on-one -on -one in two weeks or so with the national DG and our department, um, he indicated that the National Department of Public Works said there's no more money for it. I mean, I, I, I wanted to tell him that initially when he suggested it. There's not more money. Our nation is really struggling and challenging. So the reality is that there isn't money for more cleaners. However, um, we will also take a look at there where the need is great at schools. We're not excluding it entirely. We're not going and uh, adding more cleaners across the board. Um, but I am re-looking a submission to assist with, uh, with the non-teaching staff at schools and the cleaning staff obviously are those that uh, must receive attention. And if a school is in dire need, then we are going to say to them through the district that they must uh, register that need and concern and we'll take a look and see how we can manage the space. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you. Chair? Was there an additional input? Chair, um, I was asked for clarity on one of my questions, mm -hmm. um, which didn't seem clear um, to the SG. Is it possible that I just give clarity, Chair? Sure. Which question was that? Uh, it was the one on um, the expectations of the school safety committees. Mm -hmm. He wanted more clarity on that. Okay. And then on the cigarette. OK, so on, on that one, um, my question was basically, are there any expectations of school safety committees in keeping schools COVID-19 compliant once learners return to schools? And then I wanted to know if so, um, does WCED plan to support and monitor this? Then on the cigarettes, um, I was not being uh, um, I was not being facetious. Uh, given that these are the kind of cigarettes that are actually more harmful even than the other normal ones, um, and that cigarettes are normally utilized um, at school as an entry point for drugs. Um, uh, I wanted to know what are the mechanisms in place now to monitor even more so the use of cigarettes and then also drugs. As a, so, so um, Thank you. Yeah, that was the clarity. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Schroeder, if you could rep reply uh, briefly, um, we'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, the, the issue of cigarettes first, um, I mean, we, we uh, monitor the use of drugs a lot, so cigarettes will also be part of that, uh, of that viewing. And I do understand the point. The point is that in the potential absence of drugs, I'm not sure that drugs are going to be absent suddenly. Uh, in fact, the, the market, unfortunately, having been quiet in the last while, uh, I don't think cigarettes are suddenly going to become more uh, of a problem than what it was. Um, I, I actually think we have to be far more vigilant across the whole spectrum, including drugs, but also including cigarettes. And so the normal vigilance of staff 
uh, in this space. Perhaps all that I can say is that the monitoring and oversight and vigilance over learners uh, will be heightened in the next months. And if anything, there will be greater um, um, observance uh, of learners and learner behavior. And, and the normal action uh, with cigarettes will also be, uh, be enhanced. Um, the, the School Safety Committee. Um, uh, school Safety Committee has got a very particular function in schools. They are there. They exist there. It's got to do a lot with the safety, not so much with the health safety of schools, but it's got to do more with the safety in terms of security, uh, etc. So there are one of two options. The one is that uh, that committee can step up and also oversee COVID compliance and that support they will certainly get from the district. And also uh, the, D the uh, DBE's uh, guideline documents, um, which we will share, includes uh, material on, uh, on functionality um, and um, managing the COVID space, which includes COVID security or COVID or health security. Uh, but there's also a requirement for uh, schools to now create a COVID risk mitigation uh, committee. They've got to identify uh, the, the risks associated with COVID. Now that could be the school safety committee if they're well placed for it. I'm not going to dictate that, but there needs to be identification of key um, uh, challenges and mitigation uh, on being COVID-19 compliant within the school context. Um, it's going to become a part of life. It's going to become the new normal. I hate those catchphrases, but uh, we certainly are not going to simply be back in what was uh, in the days ahead. Um, and, and this uh, COVID-19 compliance is very important if we want to keep our schools going and our people safe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Schroeder. Um, and that concludes then our engagement with the department. I'd like to thank you all, um, Minister Schaefer um, and Mr. Schroeder, and to your teams for having prepared in the information as well as having answered our very numerous questions. Um, and we wish you very well as things start up again uh, from next week and in managing the very difficult issues that you have to. Um, be well and stay safe, and thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. And members. Um, members, we're now going to um, move on to some committee administration. Um, and so um, I'm sure many of the departmental officials will uh, leave or they're welcome to leave at this stage. We have um, two sets of minutes to adopt, as well as the um, first report of the committee, um, which will be an ongoing thing as we've been asked to report regularly to the House. Um, so I, uh, I know that the minutes have been circulated. They're also on the team's uh, document repository, but um, perhaps we can call them up. Uh, we'll start with the minutes of the 29th of April. Okay. Um, let me just see if the procedural officers are able to call it up. Please bear with me. So, could you just um, give us a second? No problem. Sharing it. Um, edit committee. Okay, edit committee. Mm, um, okay, edit. Um, okay. Thank you very much. So these are the minutes of the 29th of April. We did have one edit uh, to what was originally circulated and that was basically with the attendance and it's now been corrected. Okay, so page one.
Um, just want to check that Honourable uh, Boerter and Mackenzie were added. 